Buongiorno. So, no, I'm not going to talk, give that talk in Italian. Buongiorno is about my Italian. Uh, so, I want to talk about kernel development in general. It's not, more, not about the technical side, it's more about how that works and how that changed over time. And then at the end, I'm going to look a little bit into the future. Uh, so, let's start at the beginning. So in 1991, Linux was created. Um, I took that quote from Douglas Adams. Uh, it was regarded as a bad move and made a lot of people angry. Because some of you might know there was this huge debate between Linus and Andrew Tannenbaum, the, cre uh, the Minix professor. Um, who said, oh, this is totally wrong because monolithic kernels are dead and the only choice of design is a microkernel. Uh, yeah, we still are using a monolithic kernel and it's not that horrible, I think. Um, so that was where it started. 10,000 lines of code, 88 files, and it's not ever going to run on anything else than a 386. So I was looking into uh, the kernel code as of mid of two, uh, 1992 or end of 1992. A, a friend of mine gave me a hint there is something. Um, I was, I'm an electrical engineer from my background and I was working on uh, industry and cultural stuff, motion controllers, basically doing hardware and firmware. And operating systems was just, I just wanted to know how it looks like. And 10,000 lines over back then when I started to look at it, it was something like 15,000. Um, that was really a, a good read for a weekend. So you could understand it, it, it was fun. Um, so how did it work in the early days? So there was no mailing list, there was Usenet. Compoas Linux. Um, there's so, or some archives, but it's not everything is archived. Uh, all patches were collected by Linux. There's no change logs, nothing. There's no resource control system back then, and it took a very, very long time until we got one. Uh, so there were release tables on the FTP side and or and Delta patches and very interesting release notices or emails um, to the news group. Um, yeah, this is a new release. It fixes some stuff. End of story. Um, so it was kind of weird. And it was very slow. So one time I got it set it up on a, on a, on a 386 machine I had around. Um, and one time, some of the, one of the updates broke my IDE controller. So I de debugged it and figured it out, made it work again, then sent that off to the news group. And I created a function which was called from the init function, which was named workaround. And there I poked at registers to figure out if it's my IDE controller or not, and then fixed it up. So Linus hated the function name. Um, I only learned about that a week later because back then in the days I was on a modem and I always had to fight with my wife uh, for um, occupying the telephone line. Um, so I looked a week later and then there was about 10 postings back and forth between a few people. And at the very end, Alan Cox proposed um, to give that function a Welsh name, which is an uh, unparsable world without the vocals, something like <laughs> OK, and Linus said, no, no, I, I go for workaround. That's uh, easier. So stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of, um, it was not taken any serious. So people were just playing around with it. Um, so. 
plan its started to grow out of the diapers. So in 1995, the Linux kernel mailing list was started at Rutgers University. Um, and it was really easy to follow that. It was one, one, roughly 100 mails per month in the beginning. So from that time on, we have archives. So everything is archived, at least everything which got to LKML. Um, and as of Linux 1.3.68, the concept of maintainers got introduced. So, but that was totally different from how maintainers are working today. So maintainers meant basically that's a person who knows about the particular subsystem, and uh, but he didn't, the person didn't collect, the maintainers didn't collect patches like, like they do now, and uh, forward them to Linus. So they, some of them did, but everything was still, every single patch was still applied by Linus and was still um, worked on by Linus himself. So. What happened in that time, architectures, architecture forks started coming along. So there, were, there was an arc directory in the kernel itself, but the stuff there was mostly unusable. It was just something. Uh, the, the, the architecture development mostly happened in some, other, in some other trees, which were maintained by the architecture maintainer, and it, it caused fragmentation in the community. We're not building one in the first place. Um, and uh, during that time, because that was uh, where the, the number of patches and the number of changes uh, started to grow steadily, um, there was the first episode of Linus doesn't scale. So he said, go away, people, or at least don't see me anymore. I'm not interested. I'm taking a vacation, and I don't want to hear about it anymore. In short, get the hell out of my mailbox. So that was, it's also known as the Linux, Linux burnout uh, incident, but I don't think it's a real burnout. It's just he got fed up with all that shit uh, flowing into his inbox. Uh, but it clearly pointed out a problem that once you get that amount of changes, then not a single person just doesn't work anymore. So that, and, and when he came back from that vacation, he, he actually started to, to, to let other people um, collect patches for particular subsystems. So David Miller started to collect the networking patches, and Alan Cox uh, did uh, various things, including IDE and, and other drivers. Uh, the development model was totally different from what we have now. So it was basically a stable version, which was even numbered. And then once that was considered stable enough, we switched over to uh, an odd development version. And those things were dragging out for a long time. So I think uh, 1.3 ended up with 1.3.100. Um, so it took a long time to get development uh, trees into a shape where somebody considered it to be stable. And stable was an interesting definition, which was just mostly, we are annoyed enough by doing development, let's move to stable. And stable tree, uh, the development trees, I come to that uh, in a minute again, they were really horrible. What happened in parallel, we got various stabilized and feature trees. So it, it got the Allen Cox kernel. It was uh, a very special hardened uh, 
very stable and sometimes he also had extra features which Linus didn't like. So it was kind of an interesting to watch where to go. When he had a particular problem, he had to find the right kernel tree to, to figure out where the feature is you are looking for. So it was not this one-stop shop you know today. Uh, 2.5, that was interesting. So when 2.5 started, uh, one of the things we wanted to do is to integrate all the out-of-tree components, mostly the architecture trees, so that we have them in mainline. Uh, the way it was done is there was a big rush in the beginning, throwing everything together. It took us months to actually get something which boots. And 2.5 was, the whole thing was working that way. It was more broken than it worked. Uh, I think the memory management subsystem got rewritten three times in course of two and a half years. So it got ripped out and replaced and completely rewritten. There was no gradual approach. People were just developing a new version of it and then you just, you replaced the whole existing code in one go. There was no incremental uh, uh, change going on. It was just, let's try this. Uh, <clears throat> it was horrible. And also, well, the problem was that a lot of the developers, which were actually employed by the distro vendors already at that point, so okay, we broke the projector now. Um, so they were only working part time on 2.5 because they were mostly backporting development stuff from 2.5 into 2.4 kernels. So uh, for example, the USB subsystem got completely backported into 2.4 on the, on, the, on the enterprise kernels because they needed it there for production. So this was really a lot of friction. And uh, in the early days of 2.5, Linus ran into another scalability problem where everybody was throwing patches to him. And he said, no, this doesn't work anymore. Um, and then he introduced BitKeeper, which was the first version control system of the kernel. Um, BitKeeper is, was proprietary software. It's, I think it's released now under an Apache license or something like that. Um, and we got a free client for it. Um, and it was a huge debate because most, a lot of people didn't like the idea to have a proprietary system uh, storing their source code and no, no access to it and whatever. Uh, but Linus said, no, it's the best, the, the best uh, approach we have right now. It had limitations as well. I'll come to that in a minute. So we kind of worked with BigKeeper. So there was interesting approaches out there. There were subsystems using CVS or Subversion as a, as a, as a real con a software, uh, source control system. And then just in order to give Linus the thing, they converted it over into a BitKeeper repository so he could pull from there. So, but I was working on stuff as well in that way because I didn't want to touch that thing more than I, more than I had to. And it had a totally awkward uh, command line interface. I, it didn't really work well. Uh, but it helped a lot to, to make Linus life easier. Uh, so he could get from the maintainers this huge pre-integrated, pre-tested, non-mutable uh, patch series just by pulling them in like he does now with Git. So that was a, a huge improvement. 
Another huge improvement from that was that from that time on, we actually can look at the history of the changes. We started to write proper change logs. Not always, but uh, at least most of them are halfway useful. We are trying to, to still trying to improve that. But um, it was tremendously helpful to go there and say, OK, this happened because. Because if you go back into a 2.4 kernel and try to figure out why something was changed, you have to find the corresponding email to that. Good luck if you, if you manage. Uh, so there's a tool now. Um, it's Craigit. Uh, this can help. Uh, they, they build up databases and uh, uh, with machine learning algorithms to match uh, um, patches from a, to a particular kernel version. So you can have a decent chance to find the, the, the right spot in, e in the email archive now. It's very, very helpful if you have to go back into history. I occasionally do that um, because there's still code around from the two dot whatever days. Um, and if you look at something which is completely undocumented and you say, this doesn't make any sense, why do we have that? Why do we write into that register? There's no reason to do that. But there has to be a reason, otherwise it wouldn't be there. So going back into some email discussion thread from 1998 is really helpful sometimes. Because back then, also the patches often were sent, oh, this fixes the boot for me, period. No further explanation, and they got just applied. So it's. It's really horrible if you try to figure out why something is written in the way it is written. Um, today, it's easier, but uh, today it's more complex. You're not longer looking at 25,000 25, lines of code. You look at 25 millions. Um, and of course, the technical complexity has grown since then as well. We started off with a 386, no speculation, nothing. It was just working. Um, so the 2.6 release uh, was basically done, I'm fed up with 2.5 now, and we don't rewrite the memory allocator once more. So let's do 2.6. Uh, I don't think that any person on the planet managed to get 2.6 working proper. It booted, but uh, yeah, that was it about. Um, so it was really, really a bumpy start. And we had massive changes in the first stable releases. The memory allocator got replaced another time. So this was totally stupid. Uh, around 2.6.7, um, or 2.6.9, we came to the point where people were urging for a development tree. And we had the maintainer summit in Ottawa discussing that. And nobody was happy with doing that, because everybody still was burned by the by the 2.5 experience, two and a half years of uh, creating non-booting kernels was uh, a painful enough experience to think about whether this is a good idea to, to do. So um, Linus himself proposed to do rolling releases. And nobody could say, this is wrong, or this is worse than what we have had before. So everybody agreed, let's just try it. And um, this is the development model we use now. We just continue developing on the kernel itself, and never fork off into 
uh, long-lasting development series anymore. Um, that was a bumpy story as well. Um, so we all had to learn our lessons. So, including Linus, he made the mistake once uh, in I think that was the first version or the second he did uh, that he took a massive change in RC5, um, which then he regretted five minutes later, and then he made it really a strict rule that he only is going to change things or ma pull massive changes during the two weeks merge window period, which we do after uh, the next, uh, after a, a kernel was released and then we open up the, the flute gates for the next pile of, of things to, to integrate. Uh, this has worked out well, mostly. Um, and then in those days, uh, shortly after we switched to the to the rolling release model, it was in the two six twelve time frame. Uh, the Bitkeeper license was revoked for the free client. The reason was um, a developer who was refusing to touch that free client reverse engineered, or it was not much of a reverse engineering, it just had to have a, a, a sniffing the, the on-wire protocol of the BitKeeper client, and that was really trivial and simple. And he wrote his own, um, which then triggered Larry McFoy, the owner of BitKeeper, to revoke the, the free license. So we ended up with no version control system, again, which caused Linus to go away for a couple of weeks and not do any kernel development. So kernel development stopped completely. And he wrote Git. Um, there would have been a, a problem anyway. So in 2.6.12 ORC1, we came close to the limits of BitKeeper already, because BitKeeper had uh, a 16-bit uh, commit transaction numbering, which re means 64K uh, commits. And we had uh, 63K at that point. So we would have run into trouble anyway. Um, but yes, um, that was an interesting time. Kernel development completely frozen. No releases, nothing. Linus went silent for a couple of weeks, and then he came up with uh, the first draft of Git. Um, I took the first version from him, grabbed the, the BitKeeper trees from, from kernel org, Reverse engineered the disk, the on disk format, which, which was um, interesting to do, and then created a huge pile of scripts uh, to convert it into Git format. So back then, Git was not storing anything compressed, it was all uncompressed on disk. So the, alone, the BitKeeper history ended up being something like four gigabytes of data converted into, into Git. So it's still there. It's compressed now. It's way, way smaller uh, than back then. Um, Git is really a great tool. Uh, we have, I just checked it for the current version we are working on to, uh, for 20. Um, we have 224 uh, people committing into various Git trees, which then get integrated by Linux in the merge window. So it's it's fanned out pretty wide now. So so you have top level maintainers like the networking, which then has sub maintainers, 
in various aspects like wireless or uh, particular protocols. And then you go over to the, to the network devices, which is also split it into network courts and uh, wireless devices and other things. So we're trying to, to fan out that load uh, over the maintainers. It's still a scalability problem, but we're, close, we're working on, on, on solving that. So around 2639, uh, Linus was pitching about the numbers getting too high. So he said he ran out of uh, fingers and toes long ago. And then he decided to just make it 3.0. And in the old days, the major virtual number, when we flipped from zero to two, and uh, it was a major change. It was really massive. But now, he said, with the rolling releases, major version numbers have no meaning. So we could just use random numbers for it. And there was, I think, a mail thread in the length of 500 mails on the kernel mailing list debating the numbering scheme back then. And then he just went for 3.0 and said, I'm going to flip over whenever I run out of fingers and toes. So I'm expecting to be 4.21, not 4.21. It's going to be 5.0. But I might be wrong. He might have found new, new things. Um, so we're plugging along pretty good. And it's all about software. We only care about bugs in the software up to end of last year, where we figured out that there are bugs in hardware. And not the kind of bugs in hardware we were used to deal with, which were just malfunctioning of hardware or misdesigned hardware. That's what we are, were working on for forever. So you take any piece of, of peripheral hardware, it's always buggy. There's always something you have to work around. Uh, but then we got into the trouble of, of uh, security vulnerabilities caused by hardware, Spectre meltdown, and this was really, really horrible. Uh, the most horrible part of it was the secrecy around it. So we got informed late. Uh, I got so that it was known in June to Intel I got informed about Meltdown in October, and I got informed about Spectre. I heard rumors about Spectre before, but I didn't know anything, any details. I got disclosed to Spectre a week before Christmas. So this was the first year in, in, in my professional life when I had to uh, give up my Christmas vacation in order to get that stuff sorted before it exploded. And it was bad. Because it was different solutions for different vendors. When the, the embargo broke, all hell went loose on LKML. There were five people from the same company telling different stories about Spectre. So it was really hard to figure out what the hell is going on. And we still. Um, we still are suffering from that because some of the mitigations for Spectre never got into the kernel because nobody could work out how it, they were supposed to work. Uh, so we recently had a fallout with STIBP um, where a developer from SUSE said, hey, we sh really should get that into the kernel. We got it in. Uh, and it turned out to be a huge performance regression because the documentation from Intel was horrible bad. Uh, so we worked on it, uh, reworked the whole thing, and it's, it's fixed now. And that's where we really uh, have the exception uh, to do massive changes outside of the merge window. So the meltdown mitigations, which were a massive surgery, in how we manage page tables, which is really fundamental inner workings of the kernel, 
um, we got them into <coughs> into uh, re an, an RC5 because we had to to have it there in order to get the back the the code into the stable kernels backported. <coughs> So this is a totally new uh, field of, of what we have to deal with. And so that the next wave of vulnerabilities, SSB and L1TF, turned out to be more workable. So we really uh, talked a lot to Intel and others about how not to do that. And so we got early disclosed, but it still was horrible politics. So everybody agreed that we need to get this into stable trees, but they refused to disclose the information to the stable maintainers. So it took me six weeks, 25 emails and eight phone calls to get the stable maintainers disclosed. So that's the kind of things you really don't want to deal with. So I rather prefer to work on software or look at horrible patches or whatever. But this kind of stuff is just yeah annoying, but it's there, and we are going to deal with that for a very, very long time. Um, I expect new things to come up sooner than later. And then my prediction is that after the, the, the first waves subsided, the hardware architects are going to come up with new performance improvements in order to gain back the performance which they lost with the mitigations. And then they will build in new problems and say, oh no, nobody is ever going to find them. Because uh, actually, one of the annoying things about all the speculation issues, especially about Meltdown and L1TF, is that most of those were known. At least they were known at the theoretical level as of 1995. Uh, hilariously, there was an NSA-sponsored uh, research paper uh, which basically described what can go wrong if you do speculation the wrong way. Uh, and it warned about that. And there was a follow-up uh, paper sponsored by DARPA, uh, which pointed out more of that things, at least on the theoretical level. It was n never practically uh, exploited because we didn't have the hardware back then. Uh, and both papers were presented at the most important CPU architects conference where everybody else goes anyway and where all the other papers about speculation, what they actually implemented into their CPUs, got presented as well. So nobody can tell me seriously that they didn't know. They are obviously saying, no, we never heard about those papers, but uh, I don't believe that for a second. So uh, I, what I think is that they uh, just said, oh, nobody will ever come up with an, a reasonable exploit for that. So, but uh, some of those things is, Spectre is pretty hard to, to exploit. You have to be really, really smart. Um, L1TF, on the other hand, is that easy. And it's outright dangerous. Um, so if you have something which runs untrusted code in VMs, you better have the L1TF mitigations on. It's, it's horrible. I did an experiment with L1TF. Um, when, I heard, when I got disclosed, I never get the proof of concepts from Intel because they think they are dangerous. But when, once they tell me how that uh, how that vulnerability works, I can make my own in order to test the mitigations. So um, L1TF, I did an experiment with a brute force scan for, of the physical address space from a guest, physical address space of the host. So, and then I pinned the, the VM, the, the malicious VM on one 
hyperthread and had an SSH session on the other hyperthread, which I made sure that it was uh, restored it and then uh, showing up in a different place in the physical address space, and that it was a really big machine with 256 gig memory. And I did a brute force scan of the physical address space, and it took me between 25 and 85 seconds to get the session key. That's about what L1TF is. It's, it's really dangerous. Um, it's downplayed pretty much, but um, you can do really interesting things with that. And we're going to, to have fun with those things for a long time. Let's go back to CURL development. So I thought I have always had the impression, because I never looked at the numbers, that we are in a steep exponential gr uh, growth of kernel size. But I was surprised that we are not. So I mean, it's hard to do the numbers down there, so it's, uh, so it's kind of um, interpolated, but the, the numbers at the end are pretty accurate. So mostly since 10 years, we're, we're seeing a linear growth. That's interesting, but it's still big. The same is about developers. So there's a trend that the developers, so it's a, a little bit more noisy than the, than, the, than, than the kernel size thing. But uh, assuming that in 1991 there was exactly one developer, which is true, um, we are now who release some, somewhere 1,700 people, uh, different people contributing. And there's something like 200, 250, it varies from release to release, who are first-time contributors. But then we have, at the other end, we have about 500 people who are there every, every release. So let's talk a little bit about our tooling and setup. Uh, since the early days, we use email. And email and email. And most of our workflows are really, really centered around email. Uh, we have some uh, stuff like the Baxillas, which have uh, web interfaces. But we don't use them, because you can use Baxilla if it's set up right with email. And it's way easier to deal with. So, but now young people come into kernel development and ask for GitLab, social media, and web 5.0, GUIs and whatever. Um, no. No, don't misunderstand me. It's OK. If people want to explore that, that's perfectly fine. I can see that they want to have that, that they want to experiment with that. And it's going to happen one day. But it has to be made in a way that email workflows still work. Because breaking the workflows of people who are doing that for a long time is not going to fly. So as long as these things uh, end up in my inbox, I'm totally happy if other people use GitLab and use a browser for working. I mean, I use a browser as well for reading LWN, but that's a different story. Uh, but not for daily work. It just, I can't cope with a, I even, I use a, a, a text-based email client as well, because I, it turned out, I tried graphical email clients, and my email clients all suck. There's not a single one which doesn't. They just suck differently. So, but, uh, my inbox, and let's talk about, we talked about, I talked about, the mail size or the mail flood on LKML in 1995, 100 per month. 
we are now in the range of thousands and more only on LKML, and we have about uh, 150 mailing lists around that. So it's thousands of mails per day. And I, I'm subscribed to quite some of the mailing lists, and I do heavy filtering on the server side already with a huge pile of scripts to, fig to, to sort out stuff which I need to look at. So and I end up with something like four to 500 mails per day. So and I need a fast tool to manage that. And I try it with the mouse. It doesn't work. It, it just, just your, your fingers are way better suited to do repetitive work. You can not even ask me how I'm doing that, because I couldn't even tell you what the shortcuts are. They are just built into the fingers. And it doesn't work, it doesn't work with, with mouse. That's, I tried, and I failed. It's not the same speed. So yes, I can see that people start doing GitLab stuff. There are reasons uh, outside of the workflow why people want to do that, uh, continuous integration being one. So it's easier for getting access to, to a continuous integration system if you have that all integrated into GitLab. I'm fine with that. So people can push their uh, changes before posting into something which tests them. That's totally great. I agree. We want to have that. I would appreciate better test patches in the first place. But then it needs to be done after that. I'm not going to accept random GitLab pull requests from anyone. The reason is it doesn't fit my workflow. I would have to go into that web interface and then figure out what the hell it is about. Do a patch review on a web interface? No. It just doesn't scale, not for me. Uh, so if we can make that work in a way that it's email-based and for the other people, like we do with Baxilla. A lot of people love the GUI interface of Baxilla because it's so nice and so easy to understand. Go there and find something. No, it's not. Um, but a box assigned to me, I get by email, and I can respond in email, and people get their information uh, on the web interface. And if we can set that up with uh, GitLab or whatever people are dreaming of, um, it's great. I mean, there was a proposal when we started the, the, the L1TF uh, de mitigation development, a proposal by some people. There is a crypto chat. It's like WhatsApp, but encrypted. It's Keybase IO or something. It's, I, I just briefly looked at the website and then I ran away screaming. Uh, and they suggested seriously to use a web chat for reviewing patches. I said, no. No, thank you very much. So we ended up uh, using encrypted mailing lists, which is a pain but it's still workable. So what's coming next? Problems we have is feature retest. People try to come up with weird shit and, and want to stuff it into the kernel. We have to fight that off. Uh, there's more and more politics in the kernel because corporates want to influence the kernel. And we have a maintainability problem over time because that thing is so damned big. And we need more people. In the reviewers area, we need more people doing testing. We need more people looking at it, taking care of stuff. So yes, we need new tools, whether that's GitLab or something else, I don't know. We need unit tests. We need better documentation. Uh, we need more bug tracking, more serious bug tracking that we have now, and we are going to have academics on board and using formalized methods for development over time because complexity is too big now. It's not the 25,000 lines kernel anymore. And technology ex expands in complexity. So we have to deal with that. And that's going to introduce changes into our life. 
but I hope it won't change the workflows too much. So there are challenges to master the future. The kernel has to grow up more. It's in an adult phase now, but we really have to major more. But we're going to get there. So we always came out of those thingies which hurt us badly in a way stronger way than we were before. And I'm pretty convinced that we are going to master that in the future. And so rest assured, world domination is proceeding according to plan. Thank you. Any questions? No questions, that's great. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, I have one question. <laughs> You're talking too early. I, I have one. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> yeah, just one. Um, do, do you think that, that um, Spectre and Meltdown problem, do you consider it like a, a consequence of proprietary approach to hardware in this case, or do you think it has little to do with that? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, so if you look not, um, I think that's something people just underestimated. They didn't believe that it's, ex that it's truly exploitable. So under the assumption that they wrapped the papers, which I just, do assume that some of them actually read them. Uh, there's a reason why I have that assumption. If you look, AMD is not affected by Meltdown and L1TF. And I was talking to their hardware architects, and they confirmed that they actually did not do that, the same thing what Intel did on purpose, because they knew that it's going to be dangerous. So somebody had made, made a decision and said, oh, it's not that dangerous. It's dangerous, but not that dangerous. So security is, is something in the industry which we really have to learn more. I mean, everybody talks about security, but how secure is the world? It's, it's horrible. If you look in the industrial field, uh, we had 20 years of, oh, no, 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 it's not a problem to run Telnet on my uh, industrial control uh, system because it's in a, in a closed network. It's not going to be connected to the outside world. So this radically changed when Stuxnet happened. So that was a wake up, but it's still the same thing. Industry is still doing this. And so we really have to rethink all that and if you look at the Internet of Trouble, you have the same thing. Um, you have cameras out there which are, no, there's no security, it's just holes, big holes. And some of them got, um, uh, that was two years ago, uh, they um, grabbed something like two million cameras and ran denial of service attacks with them or using them as spam bots or whatever, or look into your uh, backyard because you exposed your camera to the world. So yes, we need to think more about security in general, and that will also make other people, like the hardware manufacturers, think more about it. I guess now with Meltdown Spectre out there and all the trouble it made, I think they won't really will be more careful in the future, but whether they completely avoid it, I doubt it. Because they will still say, oh, nobody can figure that out. That's my prediction. I, I would be happy to be wrong, but I'm too long in that business to be overly optimistic. Uh, 
Uh, is there a process in place nowadays for people like Kintel going to the kernel community and says, we have a problem, we need to talk? Yeah, so, so we, we, have, um, we have a process in place with Intel right now, which is more or less um, a gentleman's agreement. But we are working on a formalized process for further incidents so that anyone who has a kind of that issue can work with us in a way we can work with. So we're currently trying to set that up. So it's work in progress. We're, we have a document draft for the process right now, which is going through lawyers because the main issue with the whole, um, uh, with these kind of things is, and that they are fundamentally different from a regular software box. If you have a software box in the kernel, you just have to take care that the distros can catch up and roll out. So, which is something you took about two weeks. So, hardware vulnerabilities affect every operating system on the planet. So we, so we have to coordinate with Apple, with uh, Windows with whoever um, and we have for a lot of the things we have to wait for firmware updates or microcode updates in the x86 world so that is a totally different space so because if you look at especially at microcode updates um, when Intel wants to do a microcode update for a mitigation I mean, they can provide a, a proof of concept for a single c uh, CPU model uh, pretty fast. But then they have to do something like 50 microcode uh, variants for the different CPU models they have out in the market. So, and this has to go through full validation, so it takes ages. So we have to have a different process. It's not going to affect any of the software uh, bugs we have in the kernel. That's still going to be the same, but we have a formalized process in mind. Um, and the, the main hurdle we have is that the kernel community is not a legal entity. So we cannot sign NDAs. Individuals can. Individuals are covered perhaps by their employer but a lot of people cannot, and we cannot as a community as a whole. So we have to find a different way to deal with that. And that's going to be something like a memorandum of understanding or a gentleman's agreement. And we are currently talking to lawyers how to do that in a, in a way that, which then makes Intels or AMDs or ARMs or whatever uh, lawyers happy and gives them the warm and fuzzy feeling. So, yeah. That's uh, stuff we deal with uh, instead of doing proper work. Um, you talked a lot about the scalability of Linux Torvalds and the issues of Linux Torvalds, sleeping and dreaming and whatever. I wonder about the code of conduct. Is it an important thing or is it just a pff, we must ignore it? Um, in general, I think having a code of conduct is a good thing. Whether that particular code of conduct is a good thing, that's a different question, but don't, I won't, don't want to go there now. Um, so let me say so much. It, it was necessary to do that uh, for reasons I can talk about. Um, and the extra document we made, the interpretation, so I look at it in the following way, people said, oh, I, why didn't you write a proper code of conduct instead of having an a, a interpretation document? I said, so the, the answer to that is, just look at the code of conduct as is, and we removed that one paragraph, which doesn't make any sense anyway. Uh, but the rest is, look at it like an abstract law. So in, when you get a law, you always get a, uh, uh, interpretation for it or an implementation rule for it and that's what the interpretation document is it's basically telling how we want to deal with that kind of things and I think the code of conduct itself is nothing bad 
uh, letting people be nice to each other is certainly something we should not uh, uh, question. Um, and I think it's going to be there as, yes, we have it, and everything else we have to live. It's not, uh, behavior of people is not fixed by, by making a code of conduct. It's behavior of what needs to be changed. And I think this is, go I mean, we got a lot better in the last 10 years. If you go, if you go back into the old days of flame wars on Al Carmel, it was really nasty. Uh, we got way better than that, but we can still get better. But then, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a tempered person as well, and I totally admit that, and I have my explosions from time to time as well. So there's times where you just lose it. And it's nothing wrong with that, because we are all human. As long as we can go back, apologize, and mean it. I mean, if, if it just ends up in being something like, oh, I totally lost it, and then go back and apologize and do not mean it, that's useless. Uh, but most people who, who do that and apologize, they actually mean it. And Losing it is human, so it's not going, going to go away. We are not creating a perfect world by having a cock. So I don't worry about the cock too much, at least not with the interpretation document in place. Without, I would surely, because it's uh, intentionally written in a way which can, so you can turn it into anything you want and go out there and look at other projects which miss to have interpretation rules, uh, it's, it's, it has been turned around against the projects. So you can create mess with that kind of thing. And we got clear rules in place to prevent that. And so it's workable. Okay. Uh -huh. Answer, last question, sir. I hope the last. Uh, I, you show us that the number of kernel developers now increase linearly, but do you think that also increase the number of core kernel developer or uh, only some? It's not, not necessarily core, de core kernel developers. Um, so we still are short of core kernel developers. They are not growing in that in that rate at all. Um, but doing core kernel development is not fancy. So it's not virtualization. It's not cloud. It's not whatever networking. Um, no, it's it's boring work. But it's interesting and dangerous. You break everything. So if you, if you break a network protocol, you broke a network protocol. If you break the scheduler, you broke every freaking machine on the planet. <laughs> OK, thank you again.